brand first, marketing later. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I had the great pleasure of speaking with Tanisha Rafudin, the founder and creative director of Concept Culture. So Tanisha helps build environmental organizations that strategically grow their brand and business by tapping into the power of storytelling. She was a trained architect. You may remember her story from a previous uh, Business of Architecture UK podcast. Um, and she has over a decade of combined experience in architectural practice at AJ100 Firms. Uh, she's been a contributor at the Architects Journal and a communications consultant to sustainability organizations, including the Passive House Trust, Good Homes Alliance, and the Sustainable Development Foundation. She also assisted with the publication of the London 2012 Sustainable Design, Delivering a Games Legacy. Tanisha's work sits at the intersection of architecture, sustainability, and communications. Her company, Concept Culture, was founded out of a desire to combine her own passion for architecture and storytelling with her expertise, creating engaging brands and visual content. She regularly speaks at industry events, including the London Festival of Architecture and Festival of Place. She is also a committee member of Women in Architecture UK, a creative member of the London Collective, and and associate at Future City. Today's episode, we will be discussing about brand. And we're looking at what is brand in an architectural practice? What are the benefits of brand? What does it solve? What are the problems is it actually solving? And why is it important? Why do we need to know about it as architects? Um, we look at some of the mechanisms that go in place behind brand or the kinds of structures that support and build and develop brand, like a vision framework, positioning statements, and market strategy and persona. And we also look at this very interesting aspect of storytelling and looking at the origin story, your purpose story, and even the hero's journey. So this is a really brilliant conversation. As always, Tanisha delivering an enormous amount of value and gems here for your listening pleasure. So sit back, relax, and enjoy Tanisha Rafudin. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Tanisha, welcome back to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Hi, Ryan. Thanks for having me back. I'm, I'm really well, thank you. Um, and um, I'm excited to be here again um, post-pandemic because I think the last time we chatted was pre-pandemic. It and was. I was in the infancy of setting up Concept Culture, which has since uh, grown and um, I'm going to be back now sharing a different story to the one I shared the last time uh, with your audience and I'm looking forward to it. Love it. No, the, the, the last time that we spoke, it was one of the most impactful podcasts we've done and it really got so much attention um, because it was such a, a kind of intimate and real story of somebody, you know, kind of finding a new career path and figuring out what your zone of genius is, if you like, and it not fitting into the architecture, the traditional architectural path. And it kind of opened up what it is that you're doing now with, with concept culture. culture. So that story did, it resonated with myself. It resonated with a lot of our, our listeners. And this time we're going to be talking about what you've been doing with concept culture. Um, so let's start there. How would you describe concept culture? Concept Culture is a boutique creative agency that helps build environment brands with their branding and marketing. So that's our core service offer. And that would include anything from helping uh, a company start a brand from scratch or mm -hmm. refresh uh, their uh, existing brand. And then once we've uh, established what their branding looks like, uh, we then help them with their marketing and producing collateral that will help promote their brand. And that will be anything from 
designing a website uh, to, you know, pitch decks, capability decks, or, uh, you know, infographics to explain their service offer, or even uh, videos, case studies, and right down to creating content for their digital channels like newsletters or run their social media platforms. So uh, the way I like to describe it is that branding and marketing go hand in hand. Uh, not one uh, can work without the other. Both uh, components are very fundamental to a sustainable business. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and the way I'd also like to explain it, like uh, if you were to think about uh, how they to work, those two activities work in practice. Uh, so marketing will bring people to your door. Uh, you know, if you've piqued their curiosity, they'll bring people to your door. They'll knock on the door. But branding is what may, will make them come inside and stay. Uh, right. So you want to create that relationship between those two activities uh, that, are, that are running uh, in parallel for your business or your practice. Um, but I, what I will say is brand first, marketing later. So establish your brand first and then actively market it. And going back to the point about neither one can work in isolation. There's, there's no point in having a strong brand if you brand if you mm -hmm. don't shout about it. Um, but there's also no point in marketing a brand that's not strong. Right. Now, it's interesting because on a very superficial level, most people might think of brand as being like a logo or the mm -hmm. fonts that you use or something very kind of a visual identity, if you like. But we know that it's a lot more than that. We know that it's like, as you're saying here, it's the thing that has people stay and enter inside to your world, if you like. So it seems like this, it's a lot more of an emotional connection or there's something, you know, nurturing or warming or a relationship that's established through brand. How, what does it mean? What does brand mean for an architecture practice? That's a very good question. And uh, particularly for an architectural practice, I would simplify it to say that your brand is your reputation and when we frame it in 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 that light then branding becomes essential it becomes vital particularly in the built environment sector you know working in construction working in property working in real estate most of our work comes through referrals through word of mouth we do a good job once people will know about it and you know the people who you worked with will advocate for you they're they essentially become your fans so you want to protect your brand at all costs so if we frame it in the light that your brand is your reputation then becomes a no-brainer mm. that you have to invest in in your brand and invest in brand building activities wow okay i've never thought of it like that that's that's that actually puts a very powerful frame around it and something that's very important to invest in and protect so what are brand building activities? How do we kind of get a positive reputation out into our target market? So, so if we've, we've, we've talked about brand being your reputation, so that's almost intangible. So as, as we know, we can't control our reputation. You know, your reputation is what your audience perceives about you. So mm -hmm. it's scary to think that you have no control over that. But what you can do through branding activities is mold that reputation or influence that reputation. So if we if we talk about defining what branding is, so branding is essentially the creative process of building your brand through certain identity markers. And that includes your brand strategy and brand identity. That's how uh, we at Concept Culture break it down into two simple components, your brand strategy and your brand visual identity. So the brand strategy essentially acts as your guiding light. It guides your business through, you know, ups and downs, the good times and the bad times. And it essentially um, includes your vision for your practice, your mission. You know, how are you going to achieve that mission? What's the roadmap you're, you're taking? What are the steps you're, you're taking to achieve that vision? Your values. What is the value system that your your practice operates under? What's important to you? What you stand for? What you advocate for? And your purpose. So why do you exist beyond the obvious uh, reasons of generating revenue or making a profit? What mm -hmm. drives you? What makes you get out of bed in the morning and, you know, 
uh, get at, sit at your desk? You know, what exactly is driving you? So that's those are the key components of what we call a, a brand strategy framework. And there are other things that feed into that uh, framework are your positioning statements. So how do you position yourself? in the market, what is unique about you versus your competitors? Why should people come to you to commission uh, their project? Uh, so that's your positioning statement. And that is that one elevator pitch, if you like, that encompasses all the above that I, I, have, I have talked about. And then mm -hmm. to do that, uh, one of the first steps obviously is to identify your target audience. So who are the key audience personas uh, that you want to reach out to. And when I say a persona, it's essentially a pen portrait of a person. And what we typically do is pick three uh, to five, depending on how many, uh, how vast uh, the audience is or how vast the reach is. And we'd imagine who this person might be, or they might be real people. Like, you know, think about your favorite client and you create a pen portrait or persona about that uh, favorite client. Uh, and then you speak to that client and you, you create a messaging framework to speak to that, that client and you, and you want to attract more of those good clients, don't you? Mm -hmm. So, uh, so that's, um, one of the, one of the key activities we'll do when we're framing the brand strategy. Then the other, uh, key activity is obviously the market research. What's the landscape in which you're operating? Who are your competitors? So mm -hmm. you may have direct competitors, uh, the people you'll always encounter in bids, uh, for example, or you have the indirect competitors, so people or practices that you aspire to be. You know, what are they saying? What does their brand look like? How do we differentiate ourselves from our competition, particularly in something as cutthroat uh, as architecture? Um, you know, if you're in a situation uh, in a bidding uh, war where you know the, the top three, you reach the top three, and all of the architects they're you know offering the same service offer. Uh, you know, and, and same on price. How does the procurement team choose? Yeah. What will help them choose? And I'll wager that it's what the brand is all about. Got it. Very interesting. So if we just go back to this, this idea of the vision um, framework or the brand, the brand strategy framework, when you've got values, mission, and purpose inside of there, could you say a little bit about it? what what do each of those mean? So, in terms of company values how does a how does a business develop those how do they come into being how do we what's the kind of process that you'll lead a, a client through to help them get in touch with those values oh sure so how we would typically start is um we would have a brand discovery workshop and mm -hmm. and that discovery workshop depending on who the team is maybe there may be five key members of the team who represent different levels of the practice. So you'll have the principal, maybe the associate right down to uh, part twos and even a part one. So they will all come together and we'll go through a series of questions that we do also send in advance so people come to the workshop prepared. So we will unpack um, where they are or where, uh, in their brand discovery process. And that process is two ways for them to discover their brand and for us to discover uh, their brand as well, uh, you know, so we both end up learning a lot. And so once we've gone through that and we'll ask those questions, we'll ask them outright, you know, what's your vision statement? What's your mission statement? What are your values? And often mm -hmm. if, a, if a practice has not gone through that exercise before, you will get a varying set of answers, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and then uh, in that questionnaire, which is blind, so nobody can see what the other person is uh, answering. And then at the workshop, it'll all be laid out in the table. Oh, I, you know, the own the practice uh, owner thinks this way, but a part one thinks that way, and that's a really interesting uh, conversation to have. And then once we've unpacked that general feeling of what the brand is, then we'll ask the hard questions, and then we'll work together to workshop what each statement looks like. And the mm -hmm. goal is to come out, particularly with the vision and mission, is one easy, memorable, bite-sized statement that you can remember and relay to your audience over and over again. So for example, the vision, the question what we'll ask is, where do you see your practice in X years time? And now that X depends on how established the practice they are. If they're a startup, maybe we'll, we'll, we'll use small uh, metrics, so one year, three year, five years. But if they're more established uh, practice, they've been in the game for 10, 15 years, then maybe we'll look at a longer period of time 
mm-hmm. you know, 10 years plus 15, 20. Um, and so where do you want to be? What does that vision look like? Let's try to visualize it, uh, you know, and what matters to you. And then the mission uh, is the roadmap to reach that, uh, reach that vision. And then the value piece, uh, you know, it's, it's a very interesting one because what we're trying to do, uh, as we've already talked about creating that emotional connection with our audience is to humanize the brand. So you have to imagine that your brand is a person. So what is the value system that this person, um, you know, uses as their moral compass, or we talked about Mm -hmm. the guiding light to make decisions. So, you know, and it will, it will define, you know, the projects that you choose, the bids that you enter, uh, you know, what is the company culture, uh, you know, how you attract and uh, retain talent. So, and we want to choose maybe three to five because we don't always want it. Want, we can't choose every value that's in the uh, brand strategy playbook uh, because we want to really focus and we want to really zone in on who we are as a practice, what we stand for and why should people come and work with us. Got it. Okay. And so the, so the values are a kind of a, a set of philosophies or, or principles that, you, you know, the, the practice doesn't want to be violating. And are they, are they best generated then as a team or are they best generated from, say, a single point, like i.e. the founder or the leadership team? I would say they're best generated as a team. Uh, right. And that all, doesn't always happen in practice. What what generally mm-hmm. tends to happen is that the leadership team will take everyone's views into account, but then they will crystallize it. Uh, you know, and 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 you know, every practice is different, every business is different, and uh, you know, the leadership team has been in there in the game, and and they know best from that point of view. But um, my advice would always be to get the team on board because also that brings team buy in. Because right. what we also want to do during this process uh, is, you know, help to create an inclusive company culture and get uh, team buy-in. And if they're part of the brand uh, strategy process, then that gets their buy-in. And also, you know, your your team are your biggest brand ambassadors. So inviting them into this conversation, inviting them to the table to be a part of this conversation, mm. then automatically uh you know allows them to be your strongest brand ambassador so then they will go out when they network they'll you know always talk highly about you when they're on social media they'll talk highly about you and you won't have to you know force them to do so well that's an interesting concept actually is your team members becoming brand ambassadors for the for the company and without a clearly set of articulated values or a culture which actually is living those values then your team members are not going to be empowered to be able to be brand ambassadors. Um, if I think about a company like RSHP, for example, that was a, a very good example of a company where the principles were very clearly laid out and it meant that the staff and the team would naturally start conversations literally using the principles or the values of the company. Um, and it kind of just sets up a very coherent message that's being um, broadcast from the practice, if you like. Yes, that's correct. That's a great, that's a great example. So, um, you know, your value should be in the employee handbook, for example, so that Mm -hmm. becomes a part of the onboarding process. So from day one, uh, you know, the new team member, uh, you know, should feel aligned with those values. But let's go back to, um, you know, uh, and the, the whole talent war that we're going through and, you know, attracting and retaining talent. Uh, So having, you know, strong values and a strong uh, vision and mission statement, you know, on your website, that's the point where most people are going to get more information about you as a practice and an insight into, you know, what the company culture is, uh, you know, will go a long way in in helping you uh, attract the best in in the industry. And like you said, live and breathe them. So it's, it's one thing to just write them on paper, but actually, mm. you know, inculcate, inculcate them in your everyday and live and breathe them and act as brand ambassadors uh, yourself, that will help the new team member uh, be welcomed in, into the team and, and set clear expectations of what your value system is. When the, the other components here, um, the purpose and the mission, what's the difference between these two? So the purpose is 
why you do what you do. Okay, what drives you to do what you do? Well, you know, why are you an architect? You know, it's it's a and particularly, you know, in 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 it's such a tough uh profession. So I think uh you know, you have to really ask yourself why you do what you do and you know, be able to communicate that with with clarity. Because also the goal is to attract the right type of client and clients who align with your purpose as well or buy into your purpose. And how it dif- different, uh, differs from mission um, is that the vi- mission statement is your roadmap to uh, you know, achieve your vision. So let's say that your, your vision is to be the go-to architect in you know, XYZ borough for sustainable refurbishments. Okay, that's, um, that's your vision. So, uh, and then your mission then essentially is to help your client. So, so we exist to offer people in XYZ Barra uh, mm-hmm. the opportunity to live a more sustainable life. Right. And it starts at your home. So that's your mission statement. And then your purpose could be why you're doing what you're doing. Say so you, you, you generally believe in uh, being a part of resolving the climate crisis. Mm-hmm. And that's why you've chosen to help everyday people, you know, do what they can, you know, with their home. So that's how the three will differ. So they're, they're all in a way saying the same thing, but with a slightly different angle. I see. I see. And and is, so, the, so the mission sounds like it's something that's much more tangible, where there's kind of clear objectives and results. And and does it always need to be something external? So always have to be something that's kind of contributing to the outside world or to clients? Or can you have a mission in a business which is about profit and financial success and the kind of you know in the the retirement plans of the i know this is unfashionable to talk about in some in certain circles but you know the 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 financial well-being of the owners of the business and even the the financial well and hopefully and it should be the, the financial well-being of the entire team and correct the, and i i w- yes correct and i would expect those to be in your business plan outlined in right. your in your business plan so yes they are they're definitely a different elements to it. So there'll be your in, internal comms, which will cover uh, mm-hmm. the aspects of your mission and your vision that relate to business growth and business uh, sustainability. And then obviously then the external messages, what you share with uh, with the wider audience. So yes, I would agree there, there'd be both. And I, I would expect to see those uh, in your business plan because ultimately uh, the brand strategy framework has to align with the business plan. Um, right. So that ha- that uh, I I haven't mentioned it before, but uh, yes, our starting point is when we take on a client is to understand their yeah. business goals, business objectives. So where do you see yourself in in five years time? Uh, you know, is it if you want to grow your revenue by X, or you want to grow your team by X, or you want to enter a new service, uh, uh you know, market? Uh, you know, that that's what we'll identify at the outset, and then the brand strategy framework has to align with your business goals because they are essentially tools to help you meet your business goals. Got it. Got it. Okay. So the brand strategy, really, this is the point at which the public or an outside entities, audience, demographic market there, that's the point where they're interacting with you. So there needs the, the brand strategy needs to be, you know, in alignment of how we're helping you, if you like. Yes, correct. So that's essentially your audience touch point as the more technical term. Uh, so the, the tangible uh, assets that your audience mm-hmm. interacts with. Um, so the brand strategy is one of them. And the one that we've talked about before as well is the brand identity. Because, you know, we talked about your brand not being just your logo. So mm-hmm. there's the brand st- strategy that's the messaging framework. And there's the visual identity that's the visual uh, um, side of things that your comp- that your audience will see, and that will include your logo, uh, your color palette, your typography, the look and feel mm-hmm. um, of the branding, your tone of voice. You know, uh, you know, do you have a humorous tone or do you have a more sarcastic tone? You know, that those are the kind of elements uh, that your audience will interact with. And um, uh, what we want to do is to create a cohesive brand where the strategy and the visual identity align. 
And that will help you uh, maintain consistent uh, messaging and consistent mm -hmm. visual identity across all your audience touch points, which will typically be your website, your newsletter, your social media channels. Now, the, the visual identity is very interesting because as architects, we have a certain mastery over visual, well, in certain domains of, of visual communication. How do we make ensure that the visual identity is powerfully, powerfully connecting and speaking with target audiences and is not alienating and you know what 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 are what are some of the the what what makes a powerful and effective visual identity versus one that isn't well you ask a very good question but that's that's why the visual identity exercise comes after the brand strategy exercise right so once we've identified the message then the hope is that the visual identity exercise becomes easier because you've identified you know, your value systems and you've identified uh, your purpose. So that will pull out a set of keywords and abstract values, which mm -hmm. we can then create and, uh, you know, visualize as actual physical entities. So um, the goal is to have a solid brand strategy framework in place uh, is, is, my, is my advice. And naturally, the brand's visual identity with a good design team on board uh, will will come alive because that essentially becomes the brief for the visual designer because mm -hmm. uh, they will ask you the same questions, um, uh, you know. And so if they have that strong narrative already in place, then that makes their job far more easier. Mm -hmm. is, is this something that you suggest that architects um outsource or, or hire graphic designers and visual identity specialists or because it's often something you know obviously again architects got a lot of skills with being able to produce visual collateral and using all sorts of desktop polishing and adobe suites whatever um and so there's there's a there's an a kind of common thing that might happen where the company produces their own visual identity themselves do you think that's a good idea or is it worth investing with a graphic designer or visual a visual identity team i would say yes to out to outsource it because you know in business as you know do what you do best outsource the rest you know mm -hmm. that should be uh the mo of most uh most businesses and so yes i would say outsource there's nothing nothing wrong in in doing it uh yourself but a lot of the brands that we have worked with that has exactly been that position that they did it themselves. And then now 10 years later, uh, mm -hmm. we have to refresh them. Um, which is not to say that's not the right approach. Obviously there could be various reasons why you wouldn't outsource um, at the time when you're first starting out and you, you're first starting out is a very overwhelming process and there are lots of things to do. And you might think that branding is superfluous, like, you know, let's get clients in the door first um, and whatnot. But the good business leaders know to invest in branding mm -hmm. upfront and investing in the right team, you know, like, you know, shop around, talk around, you know, uh, you know, hear what other agencies uh, have been uh, doing and what's worked, or maybe they're, you know, look at your competitors or look at people that you aspire to be, who's worked on their branding, maybe reach out to their agency and have a, have a chat uh, with them. But also it brings, uh, a more objective um, perspective into the exercise rather than you working on it yourself, because you probably will get very emotionally attached to it, which is what I found, uh, particularly yes. when founders have created their own brand, they become so emotionally attached to it that they won't see the wood for the trees. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, another key exercise to do before we embark on the brand strategy exercise and that's this is in the case of an established brand is a brand audit, and so the team will review any piece of collateral that's already out there in public domain, assess their effectiveness in in the current scenario, and what we also do is uh, attempt to interview stakeholders like past clients, suppliers, uh, team members to understand how the brand is perceived because going back to your brand being your reputation, mm. you don't know what people are thinking about your brand until you ask them or until they tell you. So we kind of want to know uh, what people 
really think about the brand. And if it's not hitting the right points, then we have to address why that is. Is it the messaging? Is it the logo? Is it the color scheme? What is it that's, uh, you know, as, as you've alluded before, alienating people to come and work mm -hmm. with us? So the brand audit is also uh, an important element of that process. And that's not something you will be able to do yourself. You do need to get that outsider, <laughs> third party. Yeah. Uh, well, it's it's interesting because I can imagine, obviously, from you know, from a small practice perspective, you know, um, doing it yourself seems like the most sensible and like maybe a temporary solution. And then on the other scale of things, when I look at you know Olsen Kundigs or the RSHPs or these big practices, and you know they've got they have a, a, a team of in like of in house graphic designers, but even them, they aren't the ones who are producing the brands. You, then they hire like a pentagram company to come in and work you know and spend hundreds of thousands working on the on the the visual identity and then it's kind of in the hands of the in-house graphic designers to uphold the brand manifesto if you like that's been established by those those other consultants and it becomes obviously something as a practice grows ever more important to protect and invest in and keep nurtured and when you frame it like it's your reputation then we start to it brings another level of depth to that as opposed to it just being a visual appearance, which it can, which it's not. It's a kind of, it's a mnemonic, I guess, for that reputation, or it's something that's, as you said, influencing or molding how that reputation is listened to, heard or shaped in many ways. Yeah, absolutely. Like, you know, you're, it, it, a brand is an intangible feeling. So when you think about, um, you know, some of the, big architects out there. Let, let's talk about big, for example, Bjarke Engels mm -hmm. Group. You know, you say that word, what are the immediate, uh, you know, themes that conjure up? You, you think about RSHP, you, you, you think about Norman Foster, you think about Zaha Hadid, the more um, household architects, uh, you know, you know, m most people will, would have heard of them. Most people would, uh, would, kn would know about them. And, uh, you know, they, they uphold a certain reputation mm -hmm. that they have crafted over the years. Uh, you know, and branding is a, is a constantly evolving process. Uh, and as you grow as a business, let's say you start as a team of two and then five years later, you're a team of 20. You know, at that point, you you have to refresh that brand because you you know the message that you were sending out there as a team of two will be extremely different to the message that you want to send out as a team of so, of twenty. So does does brand create value then? Oh, 100 percent, hundred percent. Going back to you know, if you're in, you're in that bidding war on how do you how how would people choose? Uh, they yeah. probably going to choose. The person or the team with with the with the strongest brand and again the strongest reputation because they're going for the lowest risk correct mm -hmm. uh yeah. you know they're going for the safest hands uh they don't want to be uh the procurement team don't want to be the ones who uh you know chose the wrong uh <laughs> architectural team so they will they will base their decision uh you know on on your brand on 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 your reputation uh mm -hmm. but also it that that intangibility that we've we've talked about uh, you know let's let's talk about uh consumer goods and you know goods that are high-end luxury uh versus uh you know your everyday high street people pay a premium for mm -hmm. the high-end luxury nobody knows what yeah. you, are. you know sometimes yeah. you can't question it but the same item you know sold by a louis vuitton versus an h&m let's say uh for argument's sake uh people will uh, you know, those who are fans of Louis Vuitton uh, will happily pay that excess, even though they cost the same. And the quality is probably the same. The life yeah. uh, of the product is the same, but they will pay. And that's all down to the brand that Louis Vuitton have crafted and created and protected over the years. Well, this this is very interesting. When we start looking at the high-end luxury fashion world, and I often use the example of like a Hermé belt, where and a belt is something interesting because it's just a strip of leather with a buckle on it it has the same utilitarian purpose there's no real design in a belt really it's not like a suit where you can argue that you've got a silhouette and different shape and all this kind of stuff the material the quantity of material was pretty much the same there might be a little bit of difference in leather or like the quality of it 
but it's it's the same but you know a Hermes belt goes for a thousand pounds and then you can get a belt from from Primark for a tenner and it's it's like wow that's it's such an enormous difference and people will queue up around the block to get the Hermes belt um do, do is, is it possible to create that kind of margin in brand in architecture do you think oh it's happening isn't it like i mean you know look think about what uh you know the bjark ingles or zaha hadid mm-hmm. the norman fosters are charging mm-hmm. uh versus the other uh um you know medium sized practices they won't be able to charge as much as the more established brands it, it's they just won't because you know let's say for example uh you know a, a city wants to boost their reputation um and you know they think at city planning level oh we need an iconic building to bring more tourists in who are they going to go to they're yeah, going uh, to go to established brands like the bjark ingles like the zaha hadiz like the norman norman fosters and they will go straight to them and invite mm-hmm. them uh to build uh this iconic uh new structure or institution that will bring more tourists into the world and put their buildings on the map so we've seen that with the bilbao effect it's it's mm-hmm. an established uh thing uh you know the bilbao is definitely um enjoying the success of the the frank gary guggenheim um museum and uh so it's already happening ryan it's nothing new <laughs> so 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 in terms of like the, the kind of um activities for putting the brand out into the marketplace what what are some of the most effective things that architects can be doing so i would say it, you know and again it depends on where you are in in, sure. in your journey um but let's say for example the easiest would be uh, a practice starting out new so let's say um you've you you know you've hired an agency you've worked with them to to craft your brand strategy you've worked with them to craft your brand's visual identity and now they've given you a little guidebook what we call the brand identity identity guide that we've talked about and then mm-hmm. the in-house team uses to further develop the brand and further uh, put out any piece of comms into into the ether um so then obviously now you have to activate that brand so with what, we, what is called as act brand activations uh and and that is done through marketing so you create a website you maybe start a newsletter you you know get online get on on social media uh and hopefully you've done the target audience exercise and built those target personas and you start creating content and crafting messages that speak directly to that target audience and you create content um and you put out pieces bit by bit onto social media start building your newsletter uh start generating traffic to your website those are very easy and quick wins that you can establish you know as 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 a practice starting out from scratch and all the tools are available uh to mm-hmm. say that you can do that you could do that in house maybe you can get some guidance from a marketing consultant or a marketing agency but they can guide you to then essentially getting it started um by yourself and doing it in house and and these days let's let's say uh you know the gen z entering the workforce are all very much attuned with all these tunes they are you know they're like born content creators these days <laughs> you know, i feel like people are getting out of the womb and creating content for tiktok <laughs> you know that's sort of, uh um and so it's worth you know if you have uh, um um members of your team who are uh you know digital media savvy and they want to do it because let's not mm-hmm. force the people if they've come joined you to be an architect uh you know that's a different story uh because it's it's a different skill set but if you if you're not in a position to hire in house or outsource an agency and you and you have to work with uh you know the the team that you have then it's it's worth having that conversation uh with that team and creating maybe like a social media working group so some of the practices that we're working with that who we do their social media for them they have an internal social media working group and we meet with them once a month and mm-hmm. uh you know guide them onto you know what you should be uh 
posting whatnot, uh, you know, this is what your audience likes, this is what your audience doesn't. So keep doing more of what they like. So those are the, so those, that's the way you can activate your brand strategy and your visual identity. And the more you put it out into the world, the more uh, traction it will get. Because at the end of the day, we want to start creating impressions. Now, impressions is a technical term which most marketeers will use. Uh, you want to create an impression in someone's mind. And the more impressions that you create, the lasting memory that will create uh, in their mind. And, and this is another thing we talk, as marketers, we talk about being front of mind all the time. This is where every impression counts. So every piece of social media content that your audience sees uh, um, adds to that impressions. And soon, so, and after you know being active on social media for a year, you will enjoy the compound effect of those impressions. Uh, and you know then you will be, enjoy staying stay front of mind of your audience. So when your audience needs you, they will remember to come to you. Right. So this is so this is a way of kind of just developing and building a relationship with that target audience of yours and by producing content, whatever that, whatever form it might be. Um, what would be your suggestions? And I guess, again, this would be a, on a kind of case-by-case -case scenario. Um, but what would be a, a general set of content strategies that you would give a practice? Um, again, very, very good question. So ultimately, you know, we, we're using content marketing as a way to market your brand to your audience. So we want to create content that is valuable to them. And, mm -hmm. and we have to establish what that looks like uh, a lot of times through trial and error. So, and because a lot of the times that, uh, a lot of the uh, ways we're publishing content, uh, be it on your website, uh, your newsletter, your social media, they're all digital now and they have very sophisticated tools to measure success. So we will identify um, who your audience is, similar to the brand strategy, who your audience is, where they hang out, so what communication channels they're using. Uh, and then we'll identify, we'll start off identifying key content pillars. So content pillars or content buckets, depending on how you want to define it, um, are, will be, act as the foundation of any piece of content that you put out there. So for example, uh, let's say one content bucket is, um, you know, your project stories and one content bucket is your practice stories and one content bucket is your values stories. Mm -hmm. So every piece of content has to sit under each of these pillars. So that's very intentional way of producing content. Um, and then we have to measure. So after a couple of months, we will measure meticulously identify what's working, what they're reading, what they're clicking, uh, what not, and then keep posting more of what's valuable uh, to them. And then um, if you're, um, you know, marketing yourselves to uh, the wider public because you're, you know, you're doing high-end homes or refurbishments, mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe your platform of choice is Instagram because that's where, you know, if someone is looking for a home, they're likely being, on Instagram and maybe even TikTok these days, depending on how old they are. Uh, if they're looking for an architect, uh, you know, they might go on TikTok or on Instagram and see, you know, what's what's cool out there. Who's doing the really cool, uh, cool work? You know, what are they designing houses that I want to, uh, I want to, I want to live uh, live in? So, you know, that's for someone who's marketing themselves uh, to the wider audience, but uh, mm -hmm. maybe in the more B two B or business to business uh, sense, and if you're, uh, you know, a, a larger practice and you're uh, attracting more business leaders in the sector, you'd want to be on LinkedIn, and you want to have those conversations on LinkedIn. You want to put thought mm -hmm. leadership pieces uh, on on LinkedIn, and uh, the way it tends to work is that if someone who needs your service, you know, en engages with that content or you know, sees the value in that piece of content, they're likely to reach out to you or send you a direct message. And then that's your ticket to take that message off LinkedIn and get on the phone mm -hmm. uh, with them. And that's usually how, uh, how it works. And it only takes one message uh, to, 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 to land you that uh, dream yeah. project or that dream climb. And it's, it's interesting, you know, we, we talk about all these different social media uh, platforms um, and I think things like 
TikTok can, can appear a little bit overwhelming or archaic or just kind of without boundaries or rules, if you like. Um, uh, uh, and it's interesting you were saying, you know, leveraging the talents and skills of perhaps younger social media savvy members of the team. Um, how do you encourage, say, the more senior members of a team or the, the, pr the principals of architecture firms to like start generating content? Because I, I often think that there's, and I don't want to alienate my younger listeners here, but there's often the older members of the team have got a lot to say. And there's a lot of experience, but they don't necessarily communicate as well to a wider audience as the younger members of the team have got. But then the younger members of the team don't necessarily have the same level of experience and the same kind of pertinent advice that, so how do we bridge that gap? Or how would you, how, how do you see practices doing that well? I think you have to work together. I think uh, both right. parties have to work, uh, work together because both parties have different uh, skills and uh, to offer. And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, usually uh, the practice leaders are the ones who have that breadth of experience and lots of insights. And, but it, it takes, it's a lot of hard work to get those insights on paper in black and white mm. and in a format uh that makes sense to the reader um yes so i think it's it's about uh working together maybe uh creating some guidelines or frameworks in house and how you're going to get those messages across so um going back to your content pillars and what you want to achieve with your content strategy uh and the other thing we haven't uh touched upon yet but this the storytelling aspect of it Mm -hmm. uh you know it's all about uh the story that you you want to tell and um and because we're humans and we humans are wired to remember stories you know the easiest way to cut through the noise is to tell a story uh we are most likely to remember stories than numbers or stats or facts and figures but the moment you package it into a, a digestible story uh you know you will begin to see more uh engagement so i think it's about working together and also um identifying what each uh practice member's strengths and weaknesses are so maybe there are some wordsmiths in your practice and you can uh leverage their writing skills maybe their uh, uh you know their their staff members, team members who are good at, uh, you know, creating videos or short form videos, which do well on on the likes of TikTok or Instagram Reels. So it's identifying what skills we have, particularly if you're a smaller team, and how we can help each other to get that message and that story out there. Because it's in mm -hmm. our collective benefit to do so. Because yeah. the practice does well, we all do well. You know, yeah. we get to keep our jobs. We get to keep do better work. We bet we get to create more impact. So yeah. it, it's definitely worth, um, you know, creating that internal working group, content working group or social media working group or whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it and have people at different levels of the practice be a part of the workbook and meet regularly and block time out in the diary that's not movable. Like this is time for content because content creation is time consuming. And if you, yeah. if you are not able to outsource it uh, for budgetary reasons, uh, then you have to be smart about how you're going to do it uh, in-house. So block time out weekly or, uh, you know, fortnightly or monthly, however you want to do it, block that time out. And that should be immovable time just to create content. Fantastic. You, you mentioned there the, this, the importance of storytelling and it's kind of, um, you know, how it's a very powerful function of creating brand and and reputation what are the components of a good story is there a framework that you would advise people using that's a good that's a good question so i think there are multiple ways uh to approach uh, approach this but if the prospect of writing a story on a blank page is frightening which it can be even for established right? sure. uh, writers yeah. the blank page is one of the scariest uh uh scariest things i think um there are a couple of um you know, again, typologies of stories that we can tell as practices. Um, and one of them um, is one of my favorite ones is the origin story, the founder story. Uh, so how your practice came about. And again, this depends on where you are in your journey. Um, but um, 
let's also uh, view this as telling the story from the superhero perspective. So, uh, you know, and this is a fun exercise we like to do with our clients. Like imagine that your brand is a superhero. What are the injustices that you're fighting? Uh, you know, what are the injustices that, that you're fighting? And, uh, you know, um, and you know, origin stories are now, you know, all very, uh, you know, all the rave, they're all top, uh, you know, so topical, uh, that that's a really good story to start off with, to at least get you into, uh, you know, the zone of writing. So just write out your, uh, origin story. Um, then another type of story that you can attempt to write is uh, the value story. So the mm -hmm. value story is the impact that you create. So you can, you can take the reader on a journey of how you solved your client's problems. So you uh, outline uh, the problem that the client had when they came to you, uh, you know, your diagnosis, the solutions that you proposed and, and the journey that you went on together, um, you know, as a team and how, if you, if you face some challenges, how, how you um, address those challenges, but uh, with the end goal of, of enlightening the reader of, the value that you created for that client and the impact that that has mm -hmm. had on the client. So for example, uh, let's go back to our example of a practice who wants to specialize in sustainable refurbishments. Like, well, how did the family's quality of life improve? Um, you know, how did their health and we well-being improve? Did they see uh, a noticeable uh, improvement uh, or did they not? So, so that's like the value story that you can, uh, that you can share. And that could be, uh, you know, per case study or, you know, per service, uh, you know, that you, you can uh, categorize it uh, depending on, on what your portfolio looks like. And then another story that you can tell is your purpose story. And then again, this ties in nicely with the origin story and the value story. So why you do what you do? Was there, a, you know, a particular incident in, in your life that set you on this path to where you are right now? And, you know, so the, so, you know, the story that I told on the last time I I was on your podcast was essentially the purpose story, how the journey I took over 10 years to get to this point where um, I thought this is my place in the world now, you know, I will grow concept culture uh, and I will help built environment brands tell better stories so mm. that they can, uh, you know, uh, create more impact and, and improve our collective built environment. So that that's my purpose and that's my purpose story. So, you know, that's, those are the three uh, stories that I think it would be a good starting point. So your origin story, a value story, and a, a purpose story. Now, in terms of a framework, um, if you want to keep it short and seed, it's as simple as starting packaging it as with a beginning, middle, and end. So, and depending on which is the hardest, uh, you know, attack the hardest bit, our hardest bit first. So if you think that the, the middle bit is the hardest, let's write as much as we can in the middle bit and then top and tail the beginning and the end. So then you have a, um, a coherent frame of, uh, uh, you know, a reference. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's as simple as that. And then the other thing, if you want to go more technical, is like you can look into what's known as the hero's journey of storytelling. And the hero's journey uh, is, is, is a technique that's applied in almost most stories that have been told since the beginning of time, you know, they're your epics like the Lord of the Rings, the Game of Thrones, or, uh, you know, leading uh, movies like uh, Forrest Gump and the like. And that takes you on a, that particular character's journey from through adversity, how they've come out of that adversity, what challenges they faced, and what was the result and the impact um, of that journey. So that's the hero's journey. Now, one can argue who is the hero of this story okay yeah. so in the case of the origin story you can be the hero of that story because you know that's your origin story you can own it you were the hero of that story and how you came out but let's say for the value story and the purpose story you want to put your client or your prospect as the hero because essentially you are taking them on a journey through problem and adversity to come out victorious at at the end you know our how do most of these epics, how do our favorite stories end, you know, good triumphs over evil, you know, uh, you know, uh, that, that sort of thing. So what, what are, what are those evils that you helped your client, client unravel to end up into this victorious uh, position or this position of joy uh, that they're now uh, enjoying? Right. So the, the, so the client's the hero and you're the practice is the guide. 
the correct. mentor. Yeah, correct. The the Yoda. Exactly. Yeah. Let let look. Yeah. Let let you are the Yoda to your clients, Luke Skywalker. Yes. Why not? Love it. Brilliant. Brilliant. Tanisha, I think that's the perfect place for us to conclude the conversation there. What have you got planned for the rest of uh, 2022, 23? Oh my God. I think um, uh, if you remember that I, I ended our last podcast saying that I'm, I'm planning to, well, I need to get to Antarctica. I mean, I, my goal is of to course. visit every <laughs> continent of, of the world. So fingers crossed, and I'm putting this out there in the public domain that it will actually happen, that I will make uh, it to <laughs> Antarctica in the next uh uh, in the next se- in the next season, so that be my 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 main life goal uh, coming to uh, fruition. And 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 as you may or may not know, getting to Antarctica is not easy and it's not cheap. Uh, so uh, you know, concept culture has definitely helped me uh, <laughs> you know, get to Antarctica. Um, well, what what will you do when you're there? <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I hope to uh, you know see a lot of penguins and whales and just just you know it's just this feeling of you know conquering I always say conquering is the wrong word but uh, you know being on the frozen continent that you know the final frontier like the end of the world uh, mm. so so to speak so like yeah manifesting it and putting it out there and now it's out in public domain so. I have to make it uh, amazing. <laughs> amazing. I look forward to hearing about this, 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 this journey. Excellent. Good. Brilliant. Well, Tanisha, thank you so much for today's conversation. A massive download there of expertise and things to how to make your brand um, effective and compelling. And I love this idea of, you know, your brand is your reputation. I think that really starts to frame uh, the depths and the richness of how important brand building is and why it's essential for um, a practice to invest in. So, Tanisha, thank you very much. I'll put all your details in the, the info of the podcast. If anyone wants to reach out to you, um, they can do that. But thank you once again for for your time. And thank you, Ryan, uh, for having me uh, back again. And um, uh, I hope that you will invite me again, maybe. Uh, absolutely after, after after i visit oh. antarctica <laughs> absolutely absolutely we do the antarctic special sounds amazing thank you ryan and that's a wrap and don't forget if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom fulfillment and profit please visit smartpracticemethod.com or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly follow the link in the information The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.